and the unlikely wisdom of historical stabbings. Now, that's kind of an unusual topic for a tech conference, I know. There was a little misunderstanding on my part when they told me the name of the conference was Execute. <laughs> but we'll try to make the best of it. Today, I'm going to talk about mindset. Mindset is one of the most important tools for an engineer, or just really anyone who solves problems. It's how we see, it's how we solve, it's how we succeed. But it's also very difficult to share. So I'm not going to try. Instead, today I'd like to tell you a story. It's a bit of a long story, so lean back in these really comfortable chairs. I'm going to tell you about something that has nothing to do with us, but in fact has everything to do with us. You ready? The year is 1612. In Japan, two politicians are at war, not with weapons, but words, exercising today what we would call soft power, trying to show who is the greatest artist, the best musicians, the, the grandest writers in their court. And one day, as part of this ongoing campaign against each other, they decide to arrange for a duel, a public exhibition of strength and skill. Now, they're not going to do the fighting, of course. Now, politicians have always known that fighting and dying are tasks best left to other people. Instead, they're going to appoint champions, symbols to represent them in this duel. So the first, champ so the first politician goes home, and he chooses one of his own, someone from his own clan, the Sasaki clan, and they decide that the best way to show their power is to fight directly. So he chooses a young man named Kojiro. Now, at this point, Kojiro is one of the most famous swordsmen in all of Japan. He's an undefeated duelist. He's been a prodigy since birth. He grew up being trained by some of the greatest martial artists of his time. Right? He's, he's, if you saw a movie about this guy, you would think that it's unrealistic because he's too awesome. All right? That's the kind of fellow this is. Now, he's famous at this point for his secret technique, the swallowtail cut. It's named after one of these birds up here, right? And they say it was so fast that it felt like you, you couldn't see it. You were just dead before he knew it. And maybe that's why it's a secret technique still. He took it to the grave, right? And they say that it was kind of like a, a downward slash followed immediately by an upward one. It was so quick, it, it felt like it was coming at you from two directions at once. And to make this even more impressive, right, your average sword about this time in history has a blade of about 70 centimeters long. This one has about 80 centimeters Kojiro's sword was folded steel several times, and it was about 90 centimeters long. And they said that he was so fast, so precise with it, that he could cut a swallow out of air without even looking. Think about the skill that takes. Now, I'm not a martial artist. I haven't studied the blade. But you can tell, like, that's, that's something pretty impressive. Now, he, he, it was amazing. He called it, it was so long, his sword. It was so long, they called it the laundry drying pole, which shows you had a sense of humor, if nothing else. Now, in the meantime, his opponent, on the other hand, his opponent, on the other hand, is a very different person. He's also an undefeated duelist, but that is the only thing they have in common, right? This man is named Musashi, and his role in this is that he wants to fight. That's why he's here. Now, Kojiro is refined, respected, educated. Musashi is none of these things. In fact, he's, he's kind of ugly. He's coarse. They say he lives on the side of a mountain, that he doesn't bathe because he's too paranoid. He doesn't cut his hair, right? He's, he's kind of a disgusting fellow, and he has a really, really bad habit. You see, in a time when most duels are fought to the death anyways, Musashi goes that extra mile. He kills when he doesn't have to. And this dates all the way back to his very first duel, when at the age of 13, he challenged a grown man to a fight and then promptly beat him to death with a wooden stick. In his opponent's defense, he was described as, quote, big for his age. And this habit has stayed with him all the way up until the most recent times. He's, he's, in his latest duel, he's riding this wave of fame right now. That's why he gets invited to this thing, right? He's riding a wave of fame as he defeated, you know, one of the most famous dojos in all of Japan. It was run by three brothers. Musashi only crippled the first one for life, but he killed the second one. And then when the third was basically honor-bound to challenge him, he killed him as well. The third brother, I should mention, was 12 years old. So this is the kind of man Musashi is. Now, as the day of the match approaches, there's a lot of concern that this is going to be broken up by people busting into the match, especially with a local hero like Kojiro involved. So they decide to have the match at a remote location, a small island, basically a sandbar, off the coast of the city, 
and they'll have it at 8 a.m. in the morning before, you know, everybody gets up. So, the day before the match, Kojiro goes home, says goodbye to folks, you know, as he always does before a big match, has a good night's sleep, wakes up, bathes, has breakfast, puts on a special vest lined with heavy red leather, and he gets in the boat, and he sails off to the island, and he meets the judges there, and they inform him that, unfortunately, the worst has happened. Musashi has overslept. Seriously, this is an actual thing that happened. Musashi has overslept. And this starts off a frantic chain of messengers back and forth between the island. You know, Musashi, are you still coming? Do you forfeit? Are you chicken? He's like, no, 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 I'm still coming. I'm still coming. He's like, you're sure you're coming? Hey, I'm still coming. He's not coming. Well, not until he gets up, has a bath, eats breakfast, haggles with the boatman, gets in the boat, heads on his way over. At this point, he's already like an hour and a half late. In the meantime, Kojiro isn't taking this lying down. He, he's understandably upset about this. So he goes to argue with the judges. He says, like, listen, we've been here for an hour and a half. Clearly, he forfeits. This is ridiculous. He's making fools of us. And the judges, you know, they're debating about this, thinking about it. In the meantime, Musashi doesn't care. He's in the boat, and he's got more important matters on his mind, specifically his hair. Apparently, there's no barbers on the side of a mountain, so it's very long, and it gets in his face. So he has to borrow a towel to tie it back. This is what he's worried about. Back on the island, the judges have decided uh, against Kojiro that, no, they can see Musashi coming. They see the boat. He'll be here in a little while. This is still going through. You're not getting out of it that easy. So Kojiro's pissed. He goes off down to the water, and he waits. Back on the boat, Musashi doesn't care. And one of martial arts, great switcheroos, he's decided, no, I'm not going to fight with a sword today. I'm going to use a boat paddle. So he decides he's going to fight with a boat paddle. So the whole thing is basically a fiasco at this point, and everybody just wants to be done with it. But they have to admit that as the boat gets closer and closer to the island, it's a perfectly sunny day, but it feels like a storm is coming. And it's not just Musashi's arrival, but it's Kojiro's anger. It's building. And they feel like this is just something is going to happen today. And you don't know what, but something is coming. You know, on the shore you have Kojiro, and he's waiting. He's armed with his years of discipline and education and training, and he's ready for this. He's ready to fight. And you have Musashi with his wild instinct and his intuition like a beast. It's unstoppable. And the moment when they actually meet, like the whole thing is just, it's over so fast. It's like thunder. What happens is this. Musashi's boat shows up. He comes up towards the shore. He steps out of the boat, but he just waits there in knee-deep water, okay? And he won't advance any closer. Meanwhile, on the shore, Kojiro is there, and he's suspicious. He doesn't like this. He thinks Musashi is about to escape back into the boat if he gets a hit in. So he advances, right? And he's got the washing pole out, and he's ready for this, you know? And he sees that how dangerous Musashi is. He knows how dangerous this man is. You can laugh at him, but he's a professional. He's going to take this seriously. And as he comes closer, he draws the washing pole, and he brings out the strongest thing in his arsenal, the swallowtail. He cuts faster than anyone can see. He's going to end this now before it gets out of hand. And on the other side, you've got Musashi, and he's there with his ridiculous boat paddle, and he's just standing there, and he gets closer and he waits for Kojiro and at the last possible moment he leaps and he strikes and he brings the whole thing down and they say for a minute everything's quiet and slowly Musashi's man in a part his long hair falls out and Sasuke Kojiro <laughs> falls down dead and Musashi turns bows to the judges steps back into the boat and leaves And just as he's leaving, he waits, and he pushes off, and the tide changes, and the boat goes out to, shore, uh, out to sea, making him impossible to follow, just as he planned it all along. Something changed that day. Sasuke Kojiro lost his life. He died. But something died in Musashi as well. After that day, he never killed anyone ever again. He fought 60 duels in his lifetime, never defeated unstoppable. But in the rest of them, he always avoided trying to hurt someone if he could. He went out of his way to avoid hurting them. He became a different man. He devoted himself to the arts. He became a sculptor, a smith, an urban planner, a gardener. He founded his own school. He became a teacher, a mentor, an adopting father for three children. 
He became a poet and a calligrapher. And shortly before his death, he finished his masterpiece, a treatise on strategy with everything that he had learned and all of his experiences. And this treatise was translated and republished and translated and republished that even today, over 400 years later, you can go to any local bookstore and buy a copy of this thing. But you know, Miyamoto Musashi might be respected as one of the greatest swordsmen who ever lived. But among artists, he's known mostly for his watercolor, for his, his monochromatic ink paintings. You know, they hang in museums today. They're considered some of the finest paintings of his generation. His favorite subject was birds. So that's my story. So what I'd like to talk to you about today is a simple question. Why did Kojiro lose? I mean, he did everything he was supposed to do. He was professional. He showed up on time. He was educated. He was disciplined. He put in all the hard work. Why did he lose? Now, you probably have a different question in mind. You probably want to know, what the hell is this crap, and what does it have to do with my computer? <laughs> so let's answer your question first. I think it has a lot to do with us, because it's about this, the Book of Five Rings. This is Musashi's great work. The five rings, in case you're wondering, by the way, come from like five elements kind of in Buddhist thought, fire, water, wind, earth, heart, no, void. Um, and this is, somebody gets it. And this is like uh, an interesting thing. Now the Bisbros got their hands on this book in the 80s, and when they read it, they found it to be all about like information on how to defeat your opponent and stab them and modern strategy and Japanese mind insight, you know? But when I read it, I got a very different thing. I found a really interesting theory of knowledge. Because Musashi believed that his time and his expertise in strategy wasn't limited to just that. He wrote, when I apply the principle of strategy to the ways of different arts and crafts, I no longer have need for a teacher in any domain. Now, this isn't arrogance. He's not saying there's nothing no one can teach me. He's saying that he has developed a skill set to a point where, given a starting point, he can bring himself to mastery on his own. And if you look at his artistic achievements, you kind of have to admit there might be something to that. Now, one of the other interesting things is that Musashi is a fairly humble person at this point in his life. You know, a lot of people would love to compare what they do to sword fighters and duelists and samurais. It sounds very exciting and interesting, but Musashi has a much more humble metaphor in mind and one that's very familiar to us. He says he's like a carpenter. He says developing strategy is like building a house. And the most important thing in building a house is the ability to discern, to know the qualities of the things you're dealing with. So if you have a pile of wood here, right, and some of it is straight and strong and it doesn't have knots, then use that for the front pillars of the house because it looks good and it's, it's built well. If you have some that's straight and strong but has a few knots, use it for the back pillars. If you have some that's weak and, and kind of ugly, use it for, you know, scaffolding. And he says the same thing is true for people. He says when you're building a house, it's key to know where to assign people. If they have a high level of skill, put them on the aesthetic pieces, the things that have to be done with delicate craftsmanship. If they have some skill, but you know, it's not complete yet, put them into building the framing and the things that won't be seen. If they have no skill, have them build wedges and scaffold and clean up, pick up tools. Everybody can play a part in this. There's something there if you know the trade-offs. If you know the trade-offs of what you're working with. Musashi was obsessed with trade-offs. He was very practical. He lived in a time where there were a bajillion schools of thought and a bajillion people hawking a different way to do a thing. It's something we can kind of relate to, right? But he was obsessed with practical trade-offs. Now, you might be a little bit nervous about taking trade-offs from a guy who brought a boat paddle to a sword fight. So let's talk about the weapon, about why did he take a boat paddle. So Musashi had a choice. Now, his sword would have been metal. But let's just assume that this is that, because otherwise I'll get picked up by the cops. Why choose this? It's weird, it's kind of heavy. I mean, maybe he worked it down a little bit, but you know, it doesn't have an edge, it might break. Why choose this? What's the first thing you notice when you look at him? Longer, yes. This has more range. Now, what do we know about Kojiro's sword? What? Yes, larger than the average sword. Musashi knew that the prevailing wisdom at the time was to fight someone with a longer weapon by getting inside, 
But Kojiro was extremely fast. That's probably what everybody had tried, and he killed all of them. We saw she had a different idea. He said, what if I take a specialist at ranged fighting and I outrange him? If I put him in a situation he's never been. Nobody's ever fought Kojiro with a longer weapon before, at least not a longer sword, because a longer sword would be too heavy. Unless it's made of wood. Hmm. And if this is your strategy, you want to make sure that nobody figures it out ahead of time. You can't just walk into a sword shop and be like, hey, what's the longest thing you got? Because somebody will notice ahead of time. No, it needs to be something that you can craft yourself at the last available minute, like a bow door. Hold this for me, Lawrence. Thanks. Now, it's a present. So suddenly, when you look at it in these terms, Musashi is highly unorthodox, but he's not cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, right? There's, there's something going on here. He's got something. Now, meanwhile, what do we know about Mr. Grumpy Pants Kojiro? How did he fight? Well, he used the same sword he always does. He opens with his signature move. And his essence, there's no deception anywhere involved here. And Sun Tzu says, deception is the source of all warfare. I know, right? Sun Tzu, funny guy. <laughs> Laugh a mile. <laughs> right? So, I love his YouTube channel. <laughs> right. So, if you think about it in these terms, suddenly the outcome of the fight might not be so surprising. Now, if we zoom out away from this, right, and we get away from the actual details of the people here, just for a minute. Now, what is one of the reasons I'm bringing this up? Well, we could look at it as a clash of systems. We could say that this is really the difference between application and adaptation. You know, in this metaphor, Kojiro is all about applying a system. He's developed a whole school of swordsmanship, and he knows how to use it. He does everything exactly by the book. He knows what he's supposed to do. He should approach. He should attack before he gets within a certain range. He should not yield a, uh, something to his opponent, right? Musashi, on the other hand, isn't executing. He's not applying a specific technique. He's adapting. He's remaking a new system, a new thought about how all this should work based on this unique situation. And Musashi writes about this. He says, you must get over critical passage with the idea this event is unique. In other words, past performance is not an indicator of future results. The fact that this system worked in the past for Kojiro is no indication it's going to. You have to look at the exact circumstances you're in to determine that. Now, as an interesting bit of meta-commentary, Misha, uh, Misha was right earlier when he said that you can't do this for everything. So you'll note Musashi's phrasing, a critical passage. You know? Otherwise, we need to defer to a system to commoditize a series of decisions so that we're not overwhelmed day to day. But when your life is on the line, you best think about it. All right? Now, what does this have to do with tech? Like, what's our standpoint on this in tech? Well, I would argue that we are rooted in formalism. What is formalism? Formalism is a school of thought that says uh, we can view the world through formalizations, a, a series of a contract, a series of symbols. We say that the universe has a particular order, and that if we understand that order well enough, then we can draw up absolutely concrete laws, and we can manipulate those in some way, sort of like mathematics. Now, there's a counter school to this, or a different idea, which is that these symbols that we have, that we use, even mathematics, is just really a bunch of hoo hockey that we made up and makes sense to us. You know, math isn't real. The universe doesn't actually run on math. We have an understanding, and math is an extremely useful tool, and we should have it, and we should use it, but it's not a real thing. It's just in our heads. You know, and people have different opinions on this. You know, who would consider themselves a formalist? Yeah, like it's often called a rationalist or a scientist, you know? Who would consider themselves not a formalist? You know? Okay, you're a postmodernist or a constructionist. Apparently, most of you are somewhere in the middle. That's pretty normal. All right? Now, I would consider tech as being rooted in formalism. And that's pretty natural when you think about it. All right? We are taught by teachers who teach you in a formal manner. You know, a curriculum is a formalization of a body of knowledge. Your employers want you to formalize your methods. It makes them more adaptable. It makes it easier to put more people on your team and fire you at, for cheaper people. Right? Also, it makes you more reliable and you can give more consistent results, but who cares about that, right? It's all about us, right? And then finally, most of the predecessors, the people who developed our industry in different ways, came out of a formalist background. They were mathematicians or logicians or, you know, all sorts of different things here. They were formalist trains. Not to mention our entire work is the codification of systems or the codification of systems, if you will. But we rarely stop to think about 
You know, this idea that is this self-bootstrapping? Should we create formal systems by using a formal system? Uh, if I'm teaching you test-driven development or how to produce an ERD diagram, okay, that is a formalization, not just the creation of the diagram, but also the idea that you would create a diagram, that creating a diagram is a good idea. Those are all formalizations. Now, your professors will teach you create something this way, start here and work your way through it, apply this method. But then if you go ask them, hey Ross, did you write that piece of code using test-driven development like all the way through? Well, maybe not all the way. If you wanna see your professor squirm, ask them how often they follow the method exactly by the book. <laughs> Anyways, in essence, what I wanna say here is that creating paint is chemistry but painting a picture is an entirely different craft altogether. You could say the same about software development. But unfortunately, we're mostly taught to just apply TM, just use the things that we already have and, and just execute them, apply the method as it was taught to you using the pre-existing pieces. And so we get a, a generation of folks who often develop through pattern matching. That is to say that they feel like they have a number of pre-made pieces already that are sort of in certain shapes, they get these stones shipped to them, and they're supposed to use them to build something, like in a particular way. And this works really well as long as they stay on the beaten path, you know? But the idea of like changing the stones or making new ones doesn't really occur to them. They just sort of fit them together as they've been taught. You know, this is a repository, this is a data map or a controller, a business, uh, the logic goes here, it's, that's what they told me. You know, they don't examine the formalization, think about where it's good for. So when they get off of the beaten path, they use the same technique to produce something entirely different. And then you just look at it and you're like, what the hell is that? And they're like, it's a cat. <laughs> You're like, what? Why didn't you just draw, oh God. You know, but this is a problem. A lot of people don't realize that a formalization isn't a truth with a capital T, it's an artifact. Somebody made it. It isn't a strategy, it's a tactic. It's not an ends, it's a means. You know, a formalization is what you get when somebody takes an experience that they have, they combine it with some theory or insight about why it turned out that way, they add in context or bias, either consciously or even worse, unconsciously, and then they produce a formalization and they, they teach it to you, you pass it around. Now this is vital for transmission. Formalization is not bad. If I were trying to tell you the whole context and theory of my career, we would be here a long time, right? Like it's too much information to convey and there's a lot of extraneous detail. A formalization allows me to transmit things in an easier fashion, but it's unfortunately a lossy format we lose a lot of information in this. Like usually, if you look at like a patterns catalog or something, right, you'll get a lot of theory, maybe a little bit of like anecdotal experience for flavor, and usually no context about the situation that produced it, right? And this is really dangerous when we get ourselves into a situation that somebody didn't talk about. So for example, Lawrence, show them your paddle. We talked about how advantageous this thing was when he fought on a wide open beach because the range was a superior thing. But if Musashi had been fighting on a narrower bridge, then suddenly the shorter weapon would have a serious advantage. It would be more maneuverable. But we didn't talk about that earlier, did we? So somebody goes to apply that advice, they overgeneralize it, and they get themselves into a real sticky situation. Thank you, Lawrence. Musashi said, if you attempt to move the sword fast, like a fan or a small knife, you will have difficulties because you're straying from the sword's nature. This is crouched in sort of mystical terms, but what he's saying is you're using it for a purpose it wasn't intended. And Musashi knew this, that's why you wrote the Book of Five Rings, not the Book of Five Paddles. <laughs> but I guarantee you, if somebody at Google or Facebook found a use case for a paddle in a server room, like in a year we would have enterprise paddles for the cloud. <laughs> There'd be a whole set of conference talks about, you know, the life-changing wisdom of paddles. <laughs> kind of like this one, actually. Anyways, <laughs> there's this rich hickey quote. It says, programmers know the benefits of everything and the trade-offs of nothing. That's kind of a cheap shot, like a lot of Rich Hickey quotes, but in this case, I would say that it kind of sums up the state of affairs. You know, now, we could have a debate about is this due to we're bad people with cognitive biases, or is this kind of the state of the industry because of marketing, but let's not get into that. If we do have one big flaw, though, it's attachment. There's a well-known cognitive bias that the more time we put into learning something, the more heavily we value it. You know, we don't want to let it go, it becomes our favorite. Now Musashi writes very, very bluntly about this. Like there's a passage in the book, he says, you should not have a favorite weapon. 
Now, in tech, we've gone so far past this rule, right? It's not even about favoritism anymore. It's a question of identity. C++ engineer, senior Oracle consultant, Java specialist, right? It, 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 yeah, like it's not favoritism, it's who we are. We need to scale that back. He says, to become overfamiliar with one weapon is as much a flaw as not knowing it sufficiently well. Now, we're all very familiar, I think, with the flaws in not knowing our weapons sufficiently well, but we don't often talk about you know, the dangers of knowing too much, like how can too much knowledge be a bad thing? Well, it does if it starts to warp your thinking, if all you can think about is in terms of the trade-offs of your particular weapon, and also there's that old saying that when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Let me put it this way. If I'm on a project, if I'm on a project with somebody who knows too much about SQL or regular expressions, I get a little bit nervous because nothing good comes of that in my experience. You know, there's usually an easier way. He says, you should not copy others. Suck it, Hacker News. But use weapons which you can handle properly, adapted to your situation. He says, it is bad for commanders and troopers to have likes and dislikes. In other words, these rules are true at the high level of strategy, but also for people duking it out in the trenches. This is true all the way down. And then he concludes with saying, these are things you must learn thoroughly. In other words, I can tell you this, but it's going to take you a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to really figure it out. Now, that is a lot of wisdom and a little amount of text. That would be one hell of a tweet. But just like Twitter, the important thing usually doesn't fit. Uh, it is interesting to note that Musashi is renowned the world over for being one of the greatest swordsmen who ever lived, but in his book, he never actually refers to himself as a swordsman. He always calls himself a strategist. Just something to think about. Now, do I consider formalization harmful? Should we get rid of it? Should we be always kind of dancing on the equilibrium of trade-offs, as Musashi would have? Well, I'm not sure. There are some people who say that real software, you know, people actually out there doing this stuff, they have no need for ivory tower nonsense about how to build their software. And you can find another school of people who say software developers in the industry lack proper rigor. If only they were producing more formal proofs. Ha <laughs> ha! But the only thing the two groups can agree on is that we should just burn everything that's already out there and start over again. All right, but I think this is kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We, uh, we need to think about formalizations in a different way. We need to teach them as these are not real things, they are not your identity, they are tools that you can switch between that have different trade-offs for different situations. And we have to learn how to discern which one to use for a given situation. If you read Musashi's book, he was very much a system of no system kind of guy, but his book reads a lot like a modern pattern catalog, you know, like Refactoring or Gang of Four or whatever. It just has much, much cooler names. Arresting Shadows. Letting go four hands. I would definitely read that Fowler book. But anyways, speaking of books, this whole idea anyways, right, of like formalizations, like the most popular one in computer science or, or you know, at least industry engineering is this idea of design patterns. And the person who came up with this stuff was actually a building architect. But he has pretty firm thoughts about this too. He says, in architecture at least, the ideas of a pattern language cannot be applied mechanically. You have to weigh them off against the context of where you're actually at. Now, he was also inspired by Lao Tzu, which is one of the most famous folks in Taoism. And this book says, the way that can be told is not the true way. That sounds a little bit weird, right? But if you stop and think about it, a formalization is for transmission. It's something that can be told. But when I formalize it and hand it off to you, you're missing something. It's not the true way anymore. It's not the actual decisions, the actual trade-offs I was balancing when I made it. It's a shortened version. The way that can be told is not the true way. If you want to read a more like, practically oriented approach to this, uh, David West wrote a book a while back in 2004 called Object Thinking. This is where I got the term formalism, which I think really describes this, this phenomenon well. Anyways, he says, and he's very blunt about this, he says, formalism works close to the level of the computer, highly questionable at the level of an application, and fails at the level of complete systems and architectures. And it's fighting words. So, okay, let's say that just you're willing to entertain me, at least as a thought experiment, that formalizations are a thing with trade-offs and that we can think about them, right? That, that right or wrong, good code or bad code, only exists in the context of a specific formalization. Okay, 
now what? Like, how do I think about this? Like, how do I measure stuff? If I'm not just relying on the techniques and the theories that I was taught by my teachers, how do I think about code? Well, Musashi says the way of victory lies in creating difficulties for your opponent. Wait, who are we fighting? <laughs> okay. So it's time we talk about the enemy. All right? No, it's not your boss. If it feels like it's your boss, then you may be in a toxic work environment and you need to think about people skills, okay? But anyways, it's not your boss. When we think about an opponent, we often think about sort of a person-to-person -person fight, like hand-to-hand -hand combat or something like that. We think of an opponent as another person. But if you look at it from a literary mindset, there's another type of conflict. You can say that there's man versus nature instead of man versus man. Right? So that our fight is not against a person, but against something more primordial, a force of nature, uh, the, the death of all things, right? So it's kind of like Santiago and the old man in the sea, which apparently is also a thing you can fight with a boat or, just so you know. So keep that in mind, Lawrence. Anyways, so let's say we have a system. Your system starts here. All right? The first thing your user does is make a choice within the system. And then depending on their choice, they have to make another different choice. Okay? This is a full system. It can be at any level. This could be uh, a flow diagram. This could be a user funnel. This could be a set of conditionals and a function. Whatever you want it to be. And let's say, of these four possible outcomes, three of them are what we would consider error states. They're bad. They're not what we want. Um, and that one of them is a good state, a success state. If I were going to stay on theme, I would say that these are stabbed states and these are not stabbed states. Stabber, stabby. Wait. Anyways, okay, we would ideally like to have a system where we have more success states than failure states. All right? That would be the ideal situation. But the thing is, is that usually real life looks more like this. It's just like the law of the universe that there are more things you don't want than things you want. It's kind of inherent, unless you're okay with all the molecules in the earth rearranging into dust. I know a few people like that. They mostly seem to work at the White House, but anyways. <laughs> okay? Now, this might still be a good system if we think about the fact that there are different probabilities. Like, maybe the success state has an 80% chance of being reached. Maybe that's good for our business. Maybe we're cool with that, you know? But the enemy is keeping this stuff outside of our system. We want to keep this stuff away. Igor talked earlier about entropy, and I think entropy is the real enemy. Entropy is this tendency for systems, even working ones, to fall into disorder. You know, my system was working fine. It was great until someone did a system update. You know, you say, oh, okay, well, I'll get around this. I made a formal proof. Like, I know my system works, and it's always going to turn out exactly right. That's great. Until the hard drive fails, and then the whole thing's gone. Nice work. You know? So Musashi says the way of victory lies in creating difficulties for your opponent. I love this phrase, creating difficulties. What he's saying is that there's not a single way to defeat your opponent. I can't defeat them in a single blow. There's not a, a trick to this. I need to just create as many stumbling blocks for my opponent as I can. I need to trip them up at every chance possible. And that doesn't have to be a single system. In fact, a good strategy is like a building. It has multiple layers. Musashi's strategy was not consisting of one thing. He said, oh, I'm going to use a weapon that's longer. I'm going to outrange him and put him somewhere he's uncomfortable. I'm going to show up a few hours late to make him angry. I'm going to bring him into knee-high water so that he's slower and his speed advantage is negated. I'm going to stand and arrive at a time in which the sun is behind me so it's blinding and he can't get a good look at my weapon. None of these things will give Musashi the duel. None of them will guarantee that he wins. But each one of them, stacked on another, will give him a higher chance of reaching a success state. As developers, as engineers, as, as everything in between, we have this idea sometimes that, you know, if we do this one thing really, really well, we implement it, we'll hold everything at bay. Like, this is where we make our stand. This is it, fellas. You know, we're going to hold everything back. You know? It's not good strategy. Like, what if you put the defense of a castle up to one really bad mofo standing at the gate? Like, uh, maybe, he'll, maybe they'll pull it off, you know? Maybe she's really good. You don't know but it, it, like, there are probably better ways to do this, right? <clears throat> Keeping entropy out of your system is a multi-step process. We need walls, we need sentries, we need scouts, we need people boiling hot oil, we need people pouring hot oil, which is horrible, by the way. You know, we need archers. Like, it's a multi-pronged process. 
over and over again. You know, and there's lots of little things you can do for this. Use type systems, create good diagrams, talk to your product owners, all these things. None of them will automatically win it. There is no silver bullet, but together they give you a higher chance of reaching a success state. So when we talk about what are we trading off, right? You know, it depends is the, the one most infuriating platitude in tech, but also the one piece of universal truth we have. What are we trading off? Opening and closing states, success states and error states. I can introduce something to solve some new states, but maybe it will also introduce new errors. Maybe that's a better trade-off, maybe it's a better economy. It's a unique situation. I have to think about that. It's a critical passage, and this is the heart of trade-offs. You know, I'm gonna build a moat. You know, it'll keep more people out, but it'll also reduce my troop mobility. You know, it'll take more resources. I'm gonna introduce a new database. Maybe there's a higher chance of failure, right? I think we can view a lot of programming principles or just system design principles kind of through this lens, and this is like the only code in the talk, I'll go quick. All right, I work with a lot of people who write code like this. They say, I'm gonna set the country, I'm gonna set the product, and I'm gonna calculate the VAT. This is stateful programming. The problem is, is what if I forget to set the country? What if I forget to set the product? What if a third thing comes along? I don't know. If I set them both correctly and I calculate at the right time when I type this, it'll work. That's the success state. But there's a lot of possible failure states. Somebody has created an API that has way too many failure states. A better one might be to do this, right? We could say, when we're gonna calculate something, we'll pass these things in and we'll just do it in one go. That has a lot you know, less chance of going wrong. We can't build up the state as easily without some currying stuff, but you know, this, is, this is probably better and more idiomatic overall. But you know, there's still a possibility here that someone could stash a country or a product and a property internally. You know, and then we got some dangling state, that's not good. Okay, we could use a functional language that makes sure that that's not a possibility because there is no state there inside. Right? It's entirely deterministic. That would be really, really cool. But now we have to retrain everybody to do FP. That could be really, really hard. What's the right decision? It depends. I can't tell you, it depends on your situation. You know, unit tests or flow diagrams, explicit lists of your success and failure states. Yagni, you ain't gonna need it. Does the fix that I'm introducing introduce more error states than it removes? Boring versus new. I prefer technology where the trade-offs, the success and failure states are well explored already, not versus something where they might be unknown. All right? And when you start thinking about these things in the sense of possibilities, these are the sort of multiverse of things, right? Because the problem usually isn't how do we build it, it's how do we, you know, choose which things to build it from. You know, we often think about like when we're designing something, we think, oh, I'm designing in a void. It's, uh, there's nothing and it's a closed system and oh, now I've got something. Oh, I'm gonna build this on top of it. And a little bit more, oh, perfect, right? And it just exists in isolation. That's how computers work, right? But when you engineer, when you build in reality, a product always comes into being in an already existing state with a lot of possibilities. How I build it is determined very much by what's already there. What's the organization like? Have they done a major refactoring in the last few years? What's the budget? What's the willpower, the skill level of people involved? Is the culture good? All these things influence whether or not we build it. And when we start thinking about all of these different possibilities here, we move from this idea of building stuff as an additive process, where we're adding on to it, but to a subtractive process, where we're taking away. You know, we're removing possibilities, we're pruning it. So we say, oh, how are we gonna build this? We got all these ideas, and we have a one in 10 chance, and maybe here, in hitting a, a success state. Okay, so I'm gonna remove this idea of using this new programming language. That changes some things. Okay, we're gonna do this in the application, not in the database queries. Okay, we're gonna unit test it. Oh, that helped us squeeze some bugs out. Oh, these two things are really actually kind of the same. I talked to the product owner about it. Those possibilities can go. Maybe now I have a one in three chance of hitting a success state. Much better odds. You know, before I ever write a line of code, there's the possibility that cosmic radiation will come down from the sky and hit the bits in the RAM and produce the output that I want. I mean, it won't happen. It could happen, but it won't happen. Right, but the possibility is there. By writing code, I'm just making it more likely that I'll get the outcome I want. I'm trimming away possibilities until I get just the system I need. But I can't make the tree grow. I can just make a good place for it to grow. That's true for our systems, our software, it takes on a life of its own, but it's also true for the people, for the people you work with. 
Kim Beck has this lovely quote, I love it. He says, like, when you're making a change in an existing system, step one, make the change easy. Step two, make the change. Warning, step one may be harder than step two. Right? But this kind of environment control, when you're running a team or writing a product or, or anything like that, this is key. It's important for your code and it's important for your humans. So let's talk about the human aspect of this real quick before we wrap up. All right, now, Musashi wasn't a superhero. He was just an exceptionally driven man, like to a ridiculous level. He wrote his book while living in a cave and dying of cancer, literally. At the bottom of the hill, by the way, there was a group of people who wanted to put him in a house, but he's like, no, no, the cave is good. He's just driven. You know, he wanted to do whatever would make him sharper. He wanted to be the very best, like no one ever was. <laughs> to fight them is his real quest. To stab them is his cause. Musashi? Anyways. Okay. Basically for him, though, this meant, jokes aside, like a really hard amount of work. This was, this was, he was just incredibly driven. And, and, Incredibly clever and brutal with himself about what he did. If you read his book over and over, it says, examine this well, must be learned thoroughly, practice this day and night. Like these, one of these is like basically at the end of almost every paragraph. You know, it, it's just like blood, sweat, and tears. He can give you an idea, but he, he can't give you the full, the full piece of strategy. You're just going to have to bleed for it. You know, a thousand days of training to develop, 10,000 days of training to polish. That was his motto. And he was also a master not just looking at himself and like how to develop himself further. He was really good at the psychology of his opponent. He was kind of miles ahead of many of the other of his contemporaries, and it was kind of his core advantage. So, for example, by now you've probably figured out Musashi didn't, you know, oversleep. He made a deliberate choice to show up late to piss off Kojiro, which made him angry, which made him stupid. Okay? Now he knew this would work because he'd done it in the past. I told you before he fought three brothers previously. Uh, he showed up late for the first brother. He showed up late for the second brother. He showed up several hours early for the third brother and hid in a tree. And then when the third brother came, this time a little bit early, because they knew Musashi would be late, and the third brother brought 70 men to ambush him, that's when he popped out of the tree, but they didn't expect it, killed the brother, and ran off. He never talks about his specific duels in his book, by the way, but he does say, in strategy, you can do the same thing two times, but you can't do it three times. Anyways, now when we look at it with this sort of extreme practicality, this, this hardcore focus on, on winning, that you know, winning is all that matters. You know, it doesn't matter about formalism, it, it's about winning and, and, and adapting your system. You know, it's easy to become cold. It's easy to become cruel. To, to think that as long as I'm a good programmer, that's all that matters. But my favorite story about this whole duel here is that the night before the duel, Musashi knew he was going to show up late, right? So he slips out of the house where he's staying at from the ward, and he goes down to sleep by the, by the boat, by the ferry, because he knows he's going to show up late. And he knows if he stays in the house, then they're going to make him go on time, and he doesn't want to do that. But he also doesn't want to piss anybody off, so he sneaks out. And he doesn't stay gone long. Like an hour or two later, they realize Musashi's disappeared, and the ward sends a messenger to find him and basically tell him, get your ass back here. And Musashi writes this incredibly smug, wonderful piece of diplomacy back. Allow me to read it to you quite briefly. He says, for tomorrow's duel, you have offered to take me in your own boat. I am very grateful for your thought. I appreciate you. I didn't do this to hurt you. However, Kojiro and I are at the moment adversaries. If I were to go in your boat and Kojiro and Lord Todoki's boat, it could be awkward for your relationship with your lord. Translation, I'm doing this for you. It's, it's a favor you can't refuse. I therefore ask you to take no account of my lot. If I had told you that directly, you would have refused because you're such a nice person. This is why I decided to disappear at the last moment. I'm not making fun of you. I ask you to excuse me for this. I'm really sorry. Tomorrow morning, I will go to the island by my own means. I'm not chickening out. Please do not worry. I've got this, All right? It's a, you can almost read like how he's building his strategy, his message in there. Like he's putting the, the Lord in a, in a place where he can't refuse and bring him back. It's very clever in my opinion. And you can just picture the Lord reading it and be like, how am I going to respond to this? You wouldn't expect this kind of politically savvy response from a guy who lives on the side of a mountain, sleeps in a bear cave. 
but he was. He was, he, he was very politically savvy. He was smart. He was cultured. He spent most of the second half of his life in an artist commune, for God's sake. You know, he knew what he was doing. Now, as programmers, we often think about the idea that we don't have to get involved in politics. As long as I'm a good programmer, that's all that matters. But the opposite of politics, in my mind, isn't neutrality, it's empathy. Good products solve problems for people. They help people. We should have ethical engineering. We should use it to reach out and help people, to lift people up, to have greater diversity, to, to support people, to be an ally. Like, we should try to make the world a better place. That's what empathy is for, to understand them better. Musashi tells us, see deeply, see broadly, you know? Embrace what's out there. Study all of the ways. He wants you to be a broad person because what you learn here can affect your abilities over here. It can make you better. In military terms, I like to think of tech as a force multiplier. That is to say, it's not very interesting on its own, but when you combine it with something else, it becomes more powerful. It makes that thing much more powerful. That's what we should think about with tech. It's good when it's paired with something. People remember Musashi the swordsman for his viciousness and his determination to win, his will. They remember Musashi the strategist for his insight and his keen understanding. But today, people remember Musashi the hero for somebody who started off as a brute but became something better, something more human. I'll leave you today with this poem he wrote. He said, in my quest, I dove so deeply into the mountains. Now here I am, come out the other side, so close to humans. Thank you for your time.